Welcome back to the class Computational Neuroscience, Neural Dynamics of Cognition. We are still working on models of synaptic plasticity and learning. In the previous part, I formulated Hippian learning in terms of rate-based models. Now we will work with spikes and discuss spike timing dependent plasticity. So let's look at Hepian's statement again. He has this nice formulation that the presynaptic cell takes part in firing the postsynaptic cell. Now, in order for the presynaptic cell to participate in firing the postsynaptic one, the presynaptic spike actually has to come slightly before the postsynaptic one. So while early experiments on long-term potentiation, on Hepian learning, basically used a rate paradigm in the sense that neurons were firing at high rates and spike timing was not considered, in the 1990s, people started to look at spike timing effects. And here, I would like to discuss with you a model of spike timing dependent plasticity. So a typical experiment runs like this. I have a presynaptic spike followed by a postsynaptic one. For example, at a time difference of 10 milliseconds. And then I repeat the pre-post sequence after 50 milliseconds. So the repetition frequency is 20 hertz. Now we would like to come up with a model that account for these precise spike timing effects. And here is how we can implement such a model. Suppose the presynaptic neuron fires a spike at time tj pre. j is the index of the presynaptic neuron. Pre is just for us to remember this is presynaptic. Now the assumption is that somewhere at the synapse the spike leaves a trace. So when the spike arrives, some quantity goes up and then this quantity decays again and the decay is described by a differential equation with a time constant tau plus. So, this is just a formal description. How can we think about it? You may imagine that a spike arrives, it causes the ejection of neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft, and this neurotransmitter is bound by receptors on the postsynaptic side. So one way to interpret this curve here is to say that's roughly the amount of glutamate bound to the postsynaptic receptors. Now, if later a postsynaptic spike occurs, then this postsynaptic spike will read out the momentary value of this variable Zj+. Plus. And that's formulated here. At the moment of the postsynaptic spike, we look at the value Zj+, plus, and the amount of weight change is directly proportional to the momentary value of this variable Zj+. Plus. Now the actual jump in the weight depends on a parameter A, which in addition may depend on the weight itself. So this accounts for the sequence pre, before, post. Now similarly, we can say a postsynaptic spike leaves a trace. This trace will decay with the time constant tau minus, and if later there is a second presynaptic spike, say there's a presynaptic spike here, then we read out the value of the postsynaptic trace called Zi minus. So this term here accounts for the sequence that the postsynaptic spike occurs before the presynaptic one. The change of the weight is proportional to this parameter b, which itself may depend on w, and the total weight change is just the sum of the two. So how does this account for spike timing dependence? Well, let's look at this first differential equation. I can integrate it up, and I just get a standard exponential. So for all times larger than the presynaptic time, I get a value e to the minus t minus t pre 
and we are talking about neuron J, divided by tau plus. Therefore, the weight change that happens at the later time, T post, after T pre, is this value here. So I plug this term in. This is my set plus, which I plug in here. So I have e to the minus T minus Tj pre over tau. But I evaluate this at T post. So it becomes sensitive to the difference of spike timing. And then I copy this term in here, A of Wij. Similarly, let's consider post before pre. A postsynaptic spike leaves a trace, and this Zi minus for T larger than T post of neuron I, Zi minus is e to the minus T minus T post with a different time constant tau minus. I set this in here, e to the minus t minus t post for tau minus, and I evaluate at this time tj pre, and I have to copy this term e of wij, including the minus sign. So now I have two possibilities. Either it's pre before post, or it's post before pre. So for a single spike pair, the total weight change, delta Wij, is an exponential on this side with a time constant tau plus, and it's an exponential on this side with a time constant tau minus, and the time axis here is T pre. So if pre is before post, I'm on this side, I have this positive weight change, that's this term here. If pre is after post, then I am on this side here. So the total weight change can be written as a function of T pre minus T post. So the result of this is that as a function of pre minus post, I get an exponential window with two sides and a jump in between. And the jump size corresponds to these values A and B. And such a SDDP window nicely accounts for data, for example here, the data of B and Pooh from 1998. So far I've talked about a single pair of spikes. Now what happens if there are several spikes? So suppose I have a first spike here, then I have a second spike here, and I have a third, a third spike there. So we want to jump at each presynaptic spike so it's like putting the sum here over all firing times of the presynaptic neuron J. And this means that each time I increase by a small amount and then I will decrease again uh, with a time constant tau plus. Similarly, for the postsynaptic trace, if there are many postsynaptic spikes, then at each spike the trace will increase and afterwards it will decay with a time constant tau minus. The net result of all this is that the total change of this weight from presynaptic neuron J to postsynaptic neuron I can be written as a sum over all postsynaptic spikes let's then call F prime, all presynaptic spikes, Tj F minus Ti F prime. So this is a very simple model. It's a pair-based model. 
because what matters are pairs of spikes. So I have a contribution from this pair of spikes, but I also have a contribution from this pair of spikes and from this pair of spikes and from this one and from that one and from that one and from uh, that one and so forth. So here all pairs are taken into account and the effects of each pair just add up linearly. This kind of model has been used widely in computational neuroscience has been very successful in explaining some of the experimental data. If you want to get a further understanding of this model, please take a look at this short quiz.